Okay, let's dive into our next talk. Uh, so Graham and I are gonna talk about uh, data warehouses and Kubernetes visualized, introduction, introducing the ClickHouse Kubernetes operator UI. So this is something that, uh, that we've been beavering away at for uh, a few months. And uh, so in this talk, I'm gonna do the front part and talk about just ClickHouse on Kubernetes, how it works, how the operator uh, works, and then we'll dive in and, and, and show the UI, which is something you can actually try out at, um, at the end of this meeting because we'll, we'll include the, the URLs. So um, let's just jump in a little bit about us. So uh, Graham, my colleague, is a senior cloud engineer. He is has been working in enterprise uh, software for 25 years. Um, most recently, well, uh, one of his recent gigs was at Red Hat, where he was uh, working on Ansible, and in particular was working on the Ansible Receptor project, which uh, is used for remote commands, uh, you know, dispatching ro uh, remote commands for uh, Ansible. I'm a database geek. I'm I run Altenity, but I've um, more importantly, I've been working on databases since 1983, so it's a long time. And ClickHouse is database number 20 and definitely in my top two of, of favorites. Uh, the other one is Sybase, if, in case you're curious. Um, so a little bit about Altenity. We do support and services for ClickHouse. Uh, we have, at this point, I think, well, I haven't looked recently, but something like 160, 170 uh, subscription customers. It's a lot. and. Uh, the, uh, including a pretty good chunk of them on the cloud. Um, we also do training. Uh, we uh, do engine, you know, feature engineering. Uh, we do builds for ClickHouse, just a bunch of stuff. Anything that makes people successful at building applications that do real-time analytics based on ClickHouse. For this talk, what's significant is that we wrote the ClickHouse operator. This is something we've been working on for three years. It's the basis of our cloud system, of, of Altenity.cloud. And what we'll be showing you in this is the most recent advance, which is to stick a UI on top of it. So um, let me just uh, check that things are, okay, everything looks good on the recording. Uh, what I'm gonna do is back off a little bit uh, because I'm not going to assume that everybody here knows what Kubernetes is. So I'm gonna have a little intro to it. I hope you won't find it boring if you're a Kubernetes person. And then what I'll do is I'll show how the, the operator works. And, but it's all gonna be batch. And then we'll turn it over to, uh, to Graham to talk about the, um, to, to show the, the new UI. So um, Kubernetes is sometimes called the new Linux, which is, you know how it is when people write articles, uh, they need to have some catchy phrase. And um, in a way, it's, uh, yeah, I guess you could say that it's it's where your applications run, but it's not an operating system. What, what it is most importantly is it's an orchestration system for container-based applications. So containers being Docker or a host of other um, types of, of con uh, packaging that, that basically function the same way. So, um, that's what it does first and foremost, but it does some other things which are really important. Second is it is it represents a form of infrastructure as code where you can give a definition of something in a code-like representation, in this case, YAML, and ClickHouse will look at, or excuse me, um, Kubernetes will look at it and make it be so, and we'll see an example of that. So uh, you can basically program the system very efficiently. It's also an awesome cluster manager. And this is important because if you have um, a stack of hardware or for example, even a cloud environment and you wanna make sure that it's fully utilized or that as, as you need new capacity, it's automatically added and, and, um, and your applications get, um, get fair access to it, Kubernetes takes care of that. So in many ways, it has some of the properties that we traditionally have thought of as being handled by private clouds like VMware or Nutanix where it, um, basically ensures that you get uh, distribution of resources in some reasonable way across a set of underlying resources or underlying infrastructure. And finally, it's a pretty common endpoint for CI CD op, uh, automation. So because you can um, you know, work through APIs, you can basically have CI CD pipelines that will deploy applications. And at the end of, the, of, of, of one of your pipelines, you can basically have things plop out. You can basically, uh, you know, sort of, execute or, or deliver files to uh, Kubernetes and then basically set things up 
uh, in your Kubernetes cluster. So this um, Marvel runs in a there are it's it's one sort of huge set of of combined or you know sort of uh, cooperating if you will open source projects. Um, so it's it's under underlying um, open source. It runs in a huge number of environments. I run Minikube um, pretty uh, uh, pretty heavily in my own on my own servers. There's also um, K8s. That's another one. So there's there's a number of development or IoT sized uh, versions of this. There's also what we call self-managed Kubernetes, things like Cops and Rancher that allow you to to bring up these clusters on your own hardware or you know sort of an allocated set of VMs. And then finally, over the last few years, there's been a really prominent development in which all of the cloud vendors, um, actually large and small, are now introducing managed Kubernetes. Um, for example, Amazon EKS that runs, sets up, stands up Kubernetes, takes care of most of the dirty work of running the infrastructure for you. And uh, you pay $70 a month, something like that. And, uh, and then you can have clusters as large as you want. So this is very popular in the, in the public cloud, um, both by for users because it's a good deal to get this managed for you, and also for people like Amazon and Google because it helps them sell you infrastructure. So here's how it works if you haven't seen it before. Basically, you have applications and they consist of resources, and we'll talk a little bit about what those resources are, but the basic idea is if you define an application as a set of resources, Kubernetes will then take care of mapping it to the underlying um, hardware. So for example, you can think of that as physical nodes. These could be VMs with, um, for example, with local storage, or they could, you could have, um, you know, sort of, you could be looking at block storage here, but basically you have some underlying infrastructure that you would normally set up with Ansible, or maybe you would just um, log in and run scripts. Um, Kubernetes takes care of taking your application definitions and mapping them in to the physical um, infrastructure. So here's an example of a distributed uh, application. This looks amazingly like Zookeeper actually, where you might have three Zookeeper processes. Those are the orange things. They each have local storage. Now they talk to each other because they have a network connecting them. And when people coming in, come into Zookeeper, it's kind of nice if there's a load balancer so they don't have to remember where the actual IPs are and which ones are available and which ones are not. They just come to the load balancer and, and, and it finds a Zookeeper process automatically. So this would be the application. And when we translate this to Kubernetes, what we're going to do is define it in terms of Kubernetes resources. So we will have what's called a, uh, well, let's start at the top. Um, coming in from the entrance, we'll have the service. That's actually a load balancer. So that's a resource that represents um, that that represents some load balancer implementation, which Kubernetes will provide for you. You then have pods. Pods are basically processes. These are Docker containers, if you're using Docker, uh, which basically means they're isolated processes or more or less isolated processes. We're using C groups, we're using overlay, overlay FS, we're using namespaces so that they run in basically in their own little environments and more or less can't see each other. They can, can be combined together into something called a stateful set. That is a stateful set is a way of, of uh, you know, grouping these pods together. And you can say things like, hey, I want to have three pods. And by the way, these things will have predictable names and they will also have what are called storage claims or volume claims, which allow them to then allocate storage. And then if the pod changes or goes away or gets restarted to find it again. So the stateful set understands that it gives the pods standard names and knows how to connect them up to their volume claims. And the volume claim is just a resource that says, hey, you know, I want X amount of storage. I want 100 gigs of storage of a certain type. Um, you put this volume claim in, and then what Kubernetes will do is it will actually go allocate storage somewhere for you um, using a, a storage class, which is a, a, a thing that can, can allocate it. And then finally, you have things like config maps, which are variables, you know, think parameters that you need to feed to the application. Um, for example, if you were doing um, the, the thing we looked at the previous talk where you have a, an event stream like Red Panda talking to ClickHouse, each of these is going to have to be parameterized so that it knows, so that ClickHouse, for example, knows where Red Panda is. So that's something you could pass in 
it, th that's a variable you could pass in in a config map. So this is basically what uh, Kubernetes looks like. And it's, it's kind of complicated if you haven't seen it before. Um, but I think the aha experience for, uh, for me at least is that what Kubernetes really does is these resource definitions are the parts of a distributed application. So if you start to think about yourself as, as a, or, or your application as not being, you know, like a specific program, but to think of it as a distributed application, which needs to have configuration information, which needs load balancers, which has a notion of separate processes running on separate nodes, has attached storage, Kubernetes resources just allow you to now define these, these, uh, these distributed applications. And then it, by putting the definitions of these resources in, Kubernetes just makes it happen out on the infrastructure. Okay, so, so much for theory. Um, we want to get ClickHouse to work in this scheme. And the problem that we've run into is that ClickHouse is pretty complex. It's okay if you just have one ClickHouse, but that's pretty rare in, um, in uh, you know, in production systems. You'll normally have at least a couple so that you can use replication to make sure that the ClickHouses, the ClickHouse servers stay available. And if one of them gets killed or loses its mind, um, you know, loses storage, uh, you have other replicas that you can refer to. Larger system, of course, you'll tend to have shards. And um, so you'll, you'll split the data into disjoint sets. If you map all of this stuff to, you know, for each of these servers to, uh, you know, if you map that to the Kubernetes resources, it's horrendously complex. It's just a bunch of resources that get repeated again and again and again. And then as you upgrade or as you decide to change the, the um, size of nodes, you know, like the amount of memory, CPU, storage that you um, make available to them, the number of storage nodes, it becomes very, very difficult to maintain. On top of that, ClickHouse needs to talk to things like Kubernetes. So, so this, if we just did this by hand or, or even used uh, tools like Helm charts, where you, which is basically a templating mechanism, it would be very, very hard to make this work. So fortunately, Kubernetes has an, op, uh, an answer to this. It's called a Kubernetes operator. <clears throat> and what it does is it allows you to define new kinds of resources. So, the resource in this particular case is a ClickHouse installation. We call it a CHI, a CHI, a ClickHouse installation. And what you can do is you can basically have a YAML file which defines what you'd like this resource to look like. And you put in all the information that, um, that's necessary to define what, the, what your cluster should look like. You then upload it or apply it to, um, to Kubernetes so you take this YAML file and you run a command called kubectl minus f, apply, and you you then hand it to um, uh, hand it to Kubernetes. Kubernetes will look up the type of resource you have, and then it will say, "Aha, this belongs to the ClickHouse operator or whatever operator that resource that is responsible for managing that." And then that operator is going to look at this resource definition, and it's going to look at what's available inside Kubernetes. And it's basically going to adjust the Kubernetes reality to match your code. So, uh, so that is how um, uh, that's how uh, that's how this works. And then in the end, one thing one of the things that's cool about this is the operator takes care of setting up your application in what we call a best practice deployment. This is ideally because the operator knows how your app, you know, how your application should be set up and can take this simple, relatively simple definition of what you want and then turn it into these very complex resources for, for ClickHouse. Moreover, as your definition changes, it will then go ahead and readjust reality so that, so that your cluster on, on Kubernetes continues to have the properties that you want. So I hope that makes sense. For those of you who haven't um, worked with Kubernetes, operators are just this huge step forward and it basically allows, the, the capabilities I just described allow you to run databases on, um, on Kubernetes. And it's not just the, you know, we wrote the ClickHouse operator, but just about every database worth, uh, worthy of the name has an operator now and um, that, that functions in this way. So, what I'm going to talk about next is how to create a cluster on Kubernetes using the ClickHouse operator. So this will give you a sense of how it works. 
and um, and walk you through an example. It's all command line driven. So um, so we'll start because that's kind of the the current way that you you manage this. And um, what we'll do is there's a few simple steps when you're using operators. You uh, first of all have to install the operator itself. It's distributed as a container, and this shows the commands. Um, these are what we're doing is pulling from from our GitHub repo a YAML file that contains all the configuration information for the operator. Which um, and there's a number of files. There's a file. There's a number of 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 different types of things. There's several uh, types of resources that define the uh, define the resources that we're going to be managing. There's um, another resource that defines where to find the operator itself. Uh, some things, some more stuff related to security. It's all stuck in one YAML file. And all you do is you grab that YAML file and then you say kubectl apply minus F, give the name of the file. And what that will do is it will start the operator as a Kubernetes application by default in the kube system namespace. That's where system software lives in Kubernetes. And at that point you have an operator. Um, in this presentation, I have some stuff marked in red. These are things to note. They are health and safety um, advice and uh, just things that you ought not to do because if you do, bad things will happen. Um, so for example, if you're a Kubernetes person, you'll say, oh, you know, like if I can apply it, well, then if I want to take it away, I should delete it. That's a standard. Those two verbs are kind of um, mirror images of each other. One thing that's important to note with, with operators is you want to be very wary of taking them away when you've got live clusters because what um, deleting this file will take away the resource definitions. If you do that, um, uh, Kubernetes will say, hey, I've got resources I no longer know about and it will go ahead and delete them. So this is, a, this is an error you don't want to make. Um, so th this is true, not just, this is not just something specific to our operator, it's something that's just generally true in Kubernetes. Um, that gets you the operator. Uh, you need to have Zookeeper. We don't do anything special to, to manage it. Uh, we have some scripts in our re uh, GitHub repo, uh, which can allow you to set up Zookeepers. Here's an example. This is a dev test one. Again, there's a health and safety um, uh, note here. Um, it's going to, and the reason the health uh, thing here is it's only one Kubernetes, uh, only one, uh, excuse me, only one Zookeeper instance. You run these commands and then you'll have Zookeeper. So, and it's going to be stuck in a namespace called Zoo1NS. And what that means is, uh, click, as we'll see, Kubernetes creates uh, DNS names using the namespace dot and then whatever the name of the pod is, if you want to go find it, or the, um, the load balancer. So these two commands, or three commands, if you will, get you Zookeeper up and running. Once those are running, you can bring up a data warehouse that actually does some fun things like sharding and replication. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create a file called first.yaml, and we're going to apply it. This is the only command that you need to bring up as big a, 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 a ClickHouse uh, cluster as you could possibly wish to, to, to have. But the point is that you need to put some stuff in that file. So what I'm going to do in the next four slides is I'll show you the parts. And so first, uh, this is all one YAML file. I'm just scrolling through it. The first thing is the basics. So what kind of thing, what kind of resource are we describing? ClickHouse installation. This is what Kubernetes use, uses to decide which of the operators should get to look at this and actually do something with it. Um, then, um, you know, we have things like the name and then we have the configuration of the actual clusters. So things like, and this is where, this is where you can start to see some of the power here because we simply, if we want two shards, we just say shards count two. If we want each of those shards to have two replicas, we say replicas counts two. If we want to define the, what the pods look like, we can just um, <clears throat> use a template. I'll show you what it looks like in a second. Um, we're using one called ClickHouse Stable for the, um, for the pod template. And then we have to have a template to define our storage. And then we have a clause which says, hey, where Zookeeper live? There it is. So this is referring to the load balancer that's in front of Zoo our one Zookeeper node. And with that, we've got the basic information necessary that, that, that defines the, the, the ClickHouse topology. Next thing, it's nice to have users in databases. You don't always wanna use default and with no password as your user. So 
this shows an example in the next part of the file where we define a user called demo with password top secret. So um, this is a standard, if, if you're not familiar with, if you're familiar with ClickHouse, you'll recognize that this actually looks an awful lot like the, the XML tags just expressed in YAML. That's exactly what it is. So a tag demo, password SHA-256, that defines a, a, the user with this password and then gives it a profile and quota and sets, some, sets up some IP masks in this play. In this case, we're being pretty liberal and saying, hey, we'll take, we'll take connections from anywhere. So third thing, let's define what the pods are. So what servers do we want to run? Um, in this particular case, what we're going to do is we're going to, for the ClickHouse um, container, we're going to run uh, an Altenity stable release. These are ClickHouse builds, fully open source. Uh, this is based on 21.8.10.1. Uh, and uh, these are just, they have long, uh, basically this, this has three years of maintenance on it. So we're just gonna say, hey, we're gonna use this build. And then there's a couple other important things with when you're talking about servers, it's kind of nice if they don't all somehow cluster on the same machine. If you leave Kubernetes to its own devices, it will happily just, you know, wherever it finds memory, it will, you know, available memory and a CPU and where it can allocate the, the storage. Um, the first machine it finds or, or some random machine, it will just pick it and stick the pod there. If it happens that all the pods fit onto, you know, the pods are small enough that they can fit onto one big machine, there's a, a reasonable chance that sooner or later, they'll all end up on the same machine. So if that dies, your cluster dies. Um, what this does here, this pod distribution, is it, it applies a property called anti-affinity, and it says, hey, every pod's got to go on a separate uh, Kubernetes node. That splits them out. So if you lose a node, you're only going to lose one replica. So again, a self health and safety warning. We, we always recommend doing this for, for real, real systems. Final thing, um, storage. Well, um, Actually, there's a health and safety uh, warning up here, which is to ensure your storage is persistent. I think Graham will show an example of where it's not. That's bad. Uh, and it's true. It's double bad because not only will it fail, but it will, what's even worse, it'll run for a while before it fails. And you may not realize that, uh, that you don't have storage because ClickHouse has replication. As long as you only lose pods one at a time, they'll come back up and they'll um, they'll happily replicate back. Uh, they can they can end up replicating, you know, sort of continuing to pick up um, uh, pick up data, and you can you can have cases where you don't realize you don't have storage. So, you know, ensuring that you have persistent storage is really important. And then there's a tag here called retain, which says, hey, if we delete the installation, don't delete our volume claims with it. That's pretty important because it means if you accidentally kill the, you know, just, you know, delete the, this whole cluster, we don't want our storage to go away. And what will happen in this case, if you delete the cluster and remake it, um, when you restart it, it will come back and, um, and it'll find the original storage and reattach to it, which is pretty cool. The other things are pretty, pretty standard. If you're familiar with Kubernetes asking for hundred gigs of what's called premium RWO, this is high performance SSD in, in Google Cloud. So that's it. We put these, we have this all in one file. We applied it, Kubernetes comes up and it runs. So, um, and then once, once it comes up, we actually wanna go ahead and do a few checks to make sure it's alive. Um, so I always do safety checks, make sure I really have storage so we can list our persistent volume claims. We can make sure pods are on separate nodes. This is some um, cube cuddle magic to give a list of your pods and show which which um, node you know which VM or or host they're on. Um, and then finally, you want to just go check to see whether we can get in and and uh, actually so we can exec into the into the pod. It's just uh, same same thing that Docker allows you to do. And um, and then we can run the ClickHouse client and test that our user demo and its password secret works. So this is it. This has created a, a cluster. We can go ahead and change that file and resubmit it. And then the operator will automatically change the cluster to match it. It brings up a question. This is a lot of code and it's a lot of steps. So 
And the question is, wouldn't it be better if we just had a UI for this? And particularly if you're a dev and you want to set this stuff up, yeah, you can go read our documentation. Um, you know, you can figure out how to do it. You can go find one of like an alternative video or something like that. But in the grand scheme of things, particularly for development, people just use UIs for this stuff. So that brings us to the next part of this talk, which is to introduce the Altenity dashboard. And for that, uh, Graham, I'm gonna turn it over to you and flip up your first slide. Sure, thanks. Um, can everybody hear me? Perfectly. All right, so um, thanks for that, uh, that fairly comprehensive review of how the operator works. Um, I, I don't know about anybody else, but as you were talking, I forgot half of it in the last minute. And by tomorrow, I won't remember any of it. So the idea with uh, having a, a dashboard, an AUI, is that um, you don't have to remember all that stuff. You can just fire it up and click a few mouse clicks and make things happen. Um, so that's the basic goal. Um, we want to make it as easy as possible if you have Kubernetes up and running to deploy ClickHouse in, into it um, to see what's going on with your ClickHouse deployment and to um, be able to see it in a nice, simple view that doesn't have a lot of extraneous information. You know, you could use uh, overall Kubernetes um, dash, the, the Kubernetes dashboard product or Lens or something like that. Um, but we wanted to, to provide something where you only see the things that actually matter to ClickHouse and where we have the opportunity to give you warnings and kind of guide you through the steps um, rather than just doing kind of anything, you know, un, unbounded like you would in Lens or Dashboard. So I'm going to share my screen here. Oh, actually, uh, Robert, can you... There we go. You should be free to free to demo. All right. So uh, hopefully people are seeing this. Um, this is the uh, GitHub page for the Alternity Dashboard project. Um, this is open source. It's at a fairly early stage of development. Um, we've got a bunch of open issues, and you know, not all of the functionality that we want in here is written yet, but it's kind of at a point of critical mass where we thought it was good enough to, to let people see it. Um, if you want to just download and run it, we have GitHub releases. Um, these are single file static Go binaries. So you just download the appropriate one for your platform and run it. And that looks like like this. Um, so what I'm running against here is a freshly installed uh, Minikube Kubernetes. You know, you call it a cluster, but it has one node. Um, there's nothing in it. It doesn't have the operator deployed. It doesn't have any ClickHouse deployed. Um, so if I look at the operators list, <clears throat> I see it's empty. If I look at the list of ClickHouse installations, it gives me an error because um, it doesn't have the resource definition for ClickHouse defined in Kubernetes. So I want to deploy an operator, click the little plus sign. By default, it's going to give me the latest version. And I'm going to put the operator in Kube system, which for small, you know, for mini cube type deployments, that's pretty much where operators go. And we can see that it's now pulling the the image for it. And it's running. So that wasn't very painful. Now over here, <clears throat> we no longer have the error message because we have the CRD and we have the ability to um, deploy ClickHouse itself. Um, this uses a YAML file like, uh, like Robert was describing. Um, we can't really get away from the YAML file because the number of options to, to configure is large enough that building a UI for it isn't really feasible. But we did build in 
the examples from the docs, so you can just pull them straight up. Um, let me add a user. And instead of QWERTY, I'm going to do a hashed password. And the UI has the ability to create a hash for me. So this is the minimum possible amount of configuration to get any ClickHouse at all running. It's not going to have storage behind it. It's going to have a single shard, single replica. And it's just going to have one user. So we'll go ahead and deploy this. Um, uh, no. Did someone have a question? I think we're getting some background noise here. Gotcha. OK. So we can see that this is in progress, meaning the operator is doing something. Um, what it's doing is deploying these uh, containers, uh, pods. Um, we just finished pulling the image and now it started running and in a minute it'll go from in progress to completed. Um, you'll notice that the name of the cluster just became a clickable link. If I click on it, I get to the web UI of ClickHouse itself, which if you've used it before, you'll be familiar with. And I can run some query. So that's all it took to get from zero to being able to run queries against ClickHouse. Um, obviously, I'm not happy about the fact that I have no storage configured. And this is only a single replica, single shard. So I have a, a YAML file here. Oh, no, that's the wrong file. OK, maybe I don't have. There it is. Yeah, that's the file that I wanted. So this, um, let me update the password again. Sorry, live demos, you know. So this has, just to make it interesting, let's give it two shards, two replicas. Um, and it has real storage, um, volume claim template. It's asking for one gig of a storage class called standard on Minikube. That's the only storage class that we have. So I'm going to go ahead and deploy this. And it's called simple with storage 01. That's fine. We can watch this um, deploy pods one at a time. Within each pod, we can see the container, and we can also see the storage configuration. So we can see that this has created a persistent volume claim and that it's bound to a, an actual persistent volume. Um, as these containers come up, it should, it should launch um, the second node and the third and the fourth. Um, I'm not quite sure how long that's going to take, but I think it should already be, uh, no, maybe not quite. Jump the gun there. There we go, cluster number, uh, pod number two. And it's usable. So if I um, get tired of my ClickHouse installation and I don't want any more, I can delete one. In this case, I'm deleting all the data because there's no persistent storage. Um, I can go to edit and I get back the uh, current um, YAML of the running installation. I can edit this, I could change the number of rec replicas or shards, and the operator would then um, act to bring reality back in, in line with what the, the uh, YAML file says it should be. So that's uh, 
that's basically it. Great. Um, and this is, uh, we've been playing around with this for, I don't know, uh, I think you and I have been working on this for about a month at this point, Graham. Yeah, about that. Yeah, it's, uh, and it, as Graham said, there's definitely lots more to do, but we think this is at, we think this is at a state where we're having fun with it. So we want to put it out there and make it available to everyone else. Um, let me just, so I'm going to go ahead and Graham, I'm going to do a, get back to my share yeah. and um, let's see if I can uh, go ahead and get that back up again. Um, great. Let me know when you can, when you, when you can see that. Yeah, we got it. Okay, great. So uh, caveats. Yeah. Uh, so Graham, I think you would agree with all of these, correct? Yes, absolutely. We've got an issue for you um, with uh, several of the features that we're interested in listed in it. Um, and we're also very interested in if anybody tries it out and says, oh, I wish I could do this. Um, we'd love to hear about it. Yeah. It, a, big, um, a big priority for us is I, I think some of those health and safety warnings uh, that, that I described in the talk, we definitely want this tool to be able to tell you that you're safe you know so to remember the old marathon man movie is it safe the uh this is something that we all want to know because it's very with kubernetes it's very easy to it's very easy to bring up data um uh but it is uh the uh oh here's a great one uh rescaling storage i wonder if that actually i wonder if that works on minikube we could try it We've got a we've got a question coming in from uh, YouTube. Can you demo how to rescale your storage from one gigs to two gigs? I failed to res rescale the storage in AKS. Um, we could try it. I, that maybe what I'll do is run the rest of the slides, and then we can. If uh, Graham, is that something you would you'd like to try to see if it works? Yeah, I, I'm curious myself what might happen. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so great question. Okay, hold that thought, and we're going to uh, we're going to go try a rescale here. I. We can also, we may have to, um, it may not work in Minikube because of the way it allocates storage. So, so yeah, log, log issues. There's also the Altinity DB Slack. When these slides come out, they'll have links to them. Um, but you can log, log an issue on the project. Um, the dashboard itself is an open source project. We just open sourced it, I think, about two hours ago. Something like that. It, not much yeah. more. Sounds so it's, right. it's pretty fresh. Um, there's, of course, the Kubernetes operator. These are all links. Um, uh, and I'll show you the full uh, the, the full URLs on in, in, in the next screen. There's the Altinity documentation. Of course, there's ClickHouse. That should be a link to the ClickHouse project. And then the Altinity blog. We'll do a blog article in the, in the next couple of days to describe how this works, to talk about the workflow. But we thought it'd be more fun to just show it. And, and then we'll do... Um, we'll do a nice blog. Uh, so you can probably see that early next week. Uh, in the meantime, if you bring it up, if you know the operator, uh, um, it doesn't require much documentation. Uh, it's pretty obvious how it works. So, um, ah, I see a question coming up with, about Helm charts. I will get to that in a minute. That is a really great one. So we're at the end of the talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're hiring. Uh, the, you know, if you if you know Kubernetes, if you like uh, ClickHouse, if you like data, if you like what, actually the biggest thing we're hiring is we're trying to find a dev advocate. Um, if we can't find one by the end of, um, uh, you know, if if we can't find a dev advocate by the end of this month, I have to dye my hair purple. So it's not looking real good right now. Uh, if you can help us with that, that'd be great. Um, here are the. Uh, the projects, so the full uh, the full URLs, uh, really just um, you know if you Google GitHub Altinity ClickHouse Operator or or, or um, uh, GitHub Altinity Altinity Dashboard, that one you might not find so quickly because it's it's uh, just been up for a couple hours, uh, but that's basically how you can find these. So we have a number of questions, Graham. I'm going to let you. I'm going to unshare if you want to try rescaling the storage. That would be totally cool. Okay. Yeah, and then we'll. So this is uh, for Bo Yu, and yeah, let's let's see what happens.
Okay, I'm going to well, bet that this will work. I'm going to bet this will work, but I think because of the way Minikube allocates storage, I think ClickHouse will lose its mind. Yeah, I don't know that Minikube is going to give it back a PV that has the same data in it. Exactly. Yeah, that, that would be the test is to see whether you still have tables in it after it gets done. Yeah, one of the features we'd really like is to have uh, more communication between the UI and the, the guts of the operator so that we could see some something up here about what it's doing rather than just in progress. Um, but my guess is the operator is probably trying and failing to, to replace this volume and it can't because it's in use. Right. Yeah, I think that we do know that this rescale works on if you're using, um, if, if you're uh, using, for example, EKS, Rescale works fine. Um, the, uh, we do it a lot with uh, block storage, actually. And um, it's, a, it's a feature of our cloud. So I know it works, but we probably need to. It's a great question. I think what we can do is provide some tips on, on how, to, how to do a Rescale. And in fact, Maybe if we you need some uh, some custom knowledge within the dashboard about how to do that successfully. Yeah. Yep. Um, another thing, there was another question. Um, yeah. So this was uh, about this is uh, about volume rescaling in AKS. I assume that's that's Azure Kubernetes managed Kubernetes. Um, I actually don't know about doing it there. I've never used AKS. Um, Ah, I see. So we have a, a comment from Denise that resize works in Oz and and, uh, and Google Cloud, but it's an issue on in Azure. Um, so a question from Jonas on coming off the uh, off the stream. This is a great one. Um, uh, it is. Uh, I was wondering why there is no Helm chart available for installing the ClickHouse operator. It's a great question, and the reason is really simple. We didn't think it was necessary, um, and we were completely wrong. We've had that request from a number of people, so we're planning to build a Helm chart. Um, we we don't have it yet. Actually, if somebody wanted to to make one, we wouldn't re refuse the help. But it's definitely something that we'll be doing. So, a uh, great question, and I and and what will happen is you'll have a Helm chart that will just install the operator for you. Um, and possibly another Helm chart that would install this, um, this uh, A-dash. That's another thing that could be Helm, Helm charted. Um, so here's a question, Boyu. I noticed that the statement is gone. It doesn't mean it is now production ready. ready. What is the criteria for production ready? I think that this is, I believe this is referring to the operator, whether it is, whether it is production ready. The answer is yes. We use it for Altenity.cloud. Um, we have about 100 clusters running on it right now, uh, or it's used in at least 100 clusters at this point, more, um, and, and more coming on every day. We also have a bunch of customers who aren't running on Kubernetes uh, and, and sort of community users who are using it. Like, uh, for example, Mux uses it, eBay uses it. It's, it's very widely used at this point. So uh, definitely would not, um, hesitate to use it at this point. What we are doing with the operator is we're putting more effort into documenting it. I think the documentation was a little bit, um, shall we say, open sourcey. Uh, so we're trying to we're trying to build that out. We're putting more testing to ensure it's bomb proof. And of course, this UI is part of just making it easier to use. So, uh, all right, we have. Um, what will oh here's a great question I love this one um, from Gilad what will happen to a replicated merge tree when adding to one rep, to to the replication value in other words if you go from two from one to two replicas we will automatically copy the we will automatically copy the um, the schema across it will come up and just pick up the data so <clears throat> that's actually a, a key thing that the replicator does is it does, or excuse me, the operator is it does basic schema management that when you bring up new replicas, it'll look at what, it'll basically look at the replication setting that you have. And if a table is meant to be replicated, 
either because it's a replica on a shard or because it's being replicated to every single server, the, um, the operator will ensure the schema is put in for you.